on Wednesday, September 26, 2001, the Jamestown Bar Association was privileged to hear former U.S. Ambassador to Luxembourg, John Dulleboy, speak about his experience at the Nuremberg Trials and the times leading up to the trials in 1945. Welcome. Welcome to the Robert H. Jackson Center and to this extraordinary opportunity to meet and listen to an extraordinary man. First, the Robert H. Jackson Center was formed this year for the purposes of preserving the legacy of America's advocate, Robert Jackson. Hopefully you all received a one-page statement of our goals. We are a work in progress, and we look to the community at large, the lawyers in specific, with regards to how best we can accomplish many of those goals. Miami of Ohio University. He was naturalized in 1941, married to his wife in 1942, drafted and assigned to the Military Intelligence Center where he was trained as an interrogator. He was intimately involved in the rescue of the Lipizzan Stallions from potential harm by the Russians. And he just told me on the way down that uh, though uh, that he's part and parcel, uh, you'll see his personage in the Walt Disney movie, uh, should you ever have it in the rescue of the Lipizzan Stallions. After the war, he was assigned to the Central Continental Prisoner of War Enclosure in his native Luxembourg for a role of which he will discuss today. After World War II, his life continued to be distinguished as he worked for Procter & Gamble and was active in the affairs of the Uni University of Miami of Ohio for over 35 years. Mr. Ambassador, you need to know that there are several alums in the audience today, Then I know you've met some of them. In 1981, he was appointed ambassador to Luxembourg by President Reagan, a tour of duty that lasted until 1985. He's the author of several articles, including a book, Pattern of Circles, which I would highly recommend you purchase and possibly have autographed later during the reception. I'm his agent. Talk to me. By the way, there, there are only a few books left, so if you're interested, uh, don't wait. In order to put Ambassador Dolaboy's into a time frame, indulge me in sharing the following film. of innocent people were killed and millions more lost their homes and property. The victims cried out for justice. Those who brought this suffering must be made to answer for their crimes. After World War I, the Allies had decided in the peace treaty that people accused of war crimes should be tried. And one of the many concessions made to the Germans after the First World War was a change which the Allies had agreed to in the Versailles Treaty that the Germans would try these criminals themselves. Well, that proved an absolute and total fiasco. And uh, the Allies were not about to try that a second time. Near the end of the war, the Allies organized a war crimes commission and set up a system for bringing criminals to justice. The commission decided that individuals who committed atrocities against persons or property would return for trial near the scene of their crime. Individuals accused of specific crimes, like killing prisoners of war or downed airmen, would be brought before military courts. An international tribunal would try the major war criminals, Hitler and the men of his inner circle. But Hitler, Joseph Goebbels, and other high-ranking Nazis committed suicide before they could be arrested. The notion that there ought to be a trial under international law took hold and was really exemplified by Justice Jackson, Robert Jackson, who took leave from our Supreme Court and strongly advocated running a trial. 
which in my view had lots of merit because if nothing else it was going to establish forgetting the legal aspects of it, it was going to establish the Nazi record in an indelible fashion. One by one, the Allies found and arrested the military commanders of the Reich, the men who ran the Nazi war machine. Chief of the Luftwaffe, Reich's Marshal Hermann Goering, surprisingly turned himself in to the U.S. Army. His captors received him more like a visiting dignitary than a prisoner of war. When the press learned that Goering had fallen into American hands, of course, they wanted an interview. So the army produced Goering for a press conference, and Goering came out of the house in which, which he had been staying and sat under the trees in the garden and was thoroughly enjoying his press conference with the Americans, the, the give and take. And one of the questions was, do you, do you realize that your name is on the list of war criminals to be tried? And this, uh, this shook Goering. And uh, he replied, no, I didn't know that. And uh, it's, I, I can't imagine why. But from this point on, he was, he was not enjoying the press conference. There was nothing in his treatment at this point which, which gave him any idea that, that he was going to be uh, looked on as a war criminal. He was allowed to wear his uniform, his medals. And I think that he thought that everything was going fine. Goering's celebrity treatment ended abruptly when the army moved him to a prisoner interrogation center. It was there that he was stripped of his medals and he was, a uh, ceremonial dagger that he wore was taken away from him and uh, his insignia was removed. And I think it was at this time he realized that all was not well. Like Goering, May of 1945 saw Captain John Dolobois of the U.S. Military Intelligence Division being assigned to the Central Continental Prisoner of War enclosure located at Mondorf Palace in his native Luxembourg. Captain Dolobois, together with four other Army personnel, had a mission at the prisoner of war enclosure. Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson was to serve as the prosecutor for the United States at the Four Power International War Crimes Tribunal in Nuremberg. We were charged, says Captain Joe Dolobois, with getting the information he and his staff needed. There was much to learn about the personalities and characteristics of the Nazi leaders. We knew little about the roles many of them played in the conspiracy with which they would be charged. Who gave the orders to execute prisoners of war? Who was responsible for the final solution? What did the people know about concentration camps, slave labor? That was our mission. The following photo was shot on the front steps of the Palace Hotel by Time Magazine. It was the only group picture permitted. It was called the Class of 1945. As you look at the picture, you will see a gap in the very last row. Captain Dolloboy said, if I had stood up straight, my face would have been in the portrait too. I'd been in charge of lining up the Class of 1945 and ducked down when the photographer was ready. I've regretted my shyness of the moment ever since. Hermann Goering. Goering was the highest ranking Nazi at the first Nuremberg trial. In addition to being head of the Air Force, Goering controlled large parts of the economy and was instrumental in the Holocaust. As head of the Prussian police and Gestapo, he was a creator of the concentration camp system. Admiral Karl Dönitz was the German naval strategist. Before Hitler committed suicide, he appointed Dönitz president of the Reich. Rudolf Hess was one of Hitler's earliest collaborators. 
and had taken down Hitler's dictation of Mein Kampf. Admiral Erich Raeder commanded the German fleet until 1943, when he resigned after disagreements with Hitler. Joachim von Ribbentrop was foreign minister. He gave speeches about Hitler's peaceful intentions, but was part of the conspiracy to invade Germany's neighbors. Balder von Schirach was the Hitler youth leader. His job was teaching Nazi ideology to millions of young Germans. Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel was chief of staff of the high command of the German armed forces. He was in charge of battlefield operations. Under Keitel's direction, the German army killed millions of civilians in Poland and the Soviet Union. Fritz Saukel procured slave labor from occupied territories. Most were worked to death or gassed. Hjalmar Schacht was Reichsbank president in the 1930s. With important international banking connections, he funded Hitler's rise to power. Hans Fritzscher controlled Nazi radio propaganda. His broadcasts incited fellow Germans to commit crimes against humanity. ...of the trial due to illness. Kaltenbrunner was head of the Reich security police and had overall responsibility for concentration camps. Britain's Lord Justice, Geoffrey Lawrence. Uh, Wilhelm Keitel. All defendants pleaded not guilty. I call on uh, counsel of the United States. American Chief Prosecutor Robert Jackson opened proceedings. Mr. President and members of the tribunal, the privilege of opening the first trial in history for crimes against the peace of the world imposes a grave responsibility. The wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated, so malignant and so devastating, that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. is perhaps strangest of the men gathered about Adolf Hitler. His name, Rudolf Hess. His story, one of the most bizarre of World War II. We began when Hess was Hitler's loyal henchman, the number three man in the Third Reich. Rudolf Hess in the 1930s is Adolf Hitler's deputy. He is chief of the Nazi party, Hitler's alter ego, his most devout, his rapturous disciple. To Hess, Hitler is truly Germany. Germany is truly Hitler. The party is Hitler. Hitler aber ist Deutschland, wie Deutschland Hitler ist. Hitler, Sieg! Sieg! Because of his, his quickery, um, 
He was really not a died-in-the-wool Nazi. That did not motivate Hess. What motivated Hess was his great admiration and affection for Hitler. Hess was um, a personality. He was not a leader at all. He was a follower, and he needed a father image. He was born in Egypt. He was 15 years old before he ever came to set foot in Germany, of German parents. His parents were diplomats in Egypt. And he came to Germany to be a student under the tutelage of uh, Haushofer, the German economist. And Haushofer taught him, and eventually Hess became involved in the, the Hitler movement and became one of the staunchest followers. Because Hitler to him was the father figure. He admired, loved Hitler. He would die for Hitler. Not necessarily for Germany, not for the Nazi cause, but for Hitler. That was, that was the connection. So when Hitler named him number three, in case Hitler died, uh, Goering would follow. In case anything happened to Goering, uh, Hess would be the leader of the Third Reich. Goering objected very strong, strongly to that. And Hitler tried very hard to calm Goering down. He said, you know, it's never really going to happen because something happens to me. And this is a Goering quote. If something happens to me and you become the Fuhrer of the Reich, you can always eliminate Hess if you don't want him to succeed you. With that relationship established, let me say that I'm one of the people who is convinced that Hess flew to England on Hitler's orders, that he knew exactly where he was going and what he was doing. And I base that on my interviews with Hess, and I base it on my talks with some of the other prisoners. Um, I'm rambling all over the place here and get it all together. Hitler exercised what is known as the Führer Prinzip, the principle of leadership, which was typically Hitler. And the Führer Prinzip was that he never told A what B was doing, and B never was told what A was doing. Hitler gave everybody his job, but he didn't tell anybody else what that guy was going to do. That, that was one thing. And we kept hearing about the Fuhrer Prinzip in the course of their defense. I didn't know about this because I wasn't informed. Uh, Hitler exercised the Fuhrer Prinzip. And he merely told so-and-so what to do, but he didn't tell me that that's what so-and-so was doing. Okay. Uh, in England at the time, it was a very strong pro-German, even pro-Nazi element. The Duke of Hamilton, uh, Sir Oswald Mosley, uh, the American ambassador to Great Britain, Joseph P. Kennedy, was sympathetic to the Germans. The royal family, the House of Hanover, uh, they're related, they're cousins. So even the royal family, including Edward VIII, mm -hmm. who was quite, not necessarily pro-Nazi, but pro-German because of his bloodline, his ancestry, and everything else. So there was a pro-German element in England. Hess had met the Duke of Hamilton at the Olympics, and they had established a relationship. So Hess's mission was to fly to Scotland, land on the Duke of Hamilton's estate, get to the Duke of Hamilton, and tell him that Germany was about to invade Russia, Soviet Union. If the British would just lie low, stay out of it, I mean, just don't do anything, don't attack us, and keep the Americans out of it, definitely, that would give the Germans an opportunity to invade the Soviet Union and create a bulwark between Western democracy and Eastern communism. The plant him as Hitler's heir. A fanatical anti-communist, Hess is heartbroken at Hitler's cynical pact with Stalin. Yet he fears a two-front war and is disturbed by visions of English children bombed by Germany's growing air fleet. 
Like Hitler, he dreams that Nordic England should be Nordic Germany's ally. Out of fear, disappointment, dream, comes a plan. He, Rudolf Hess, will take one of these planes, fly to Britain, talk with the king, and save Germany. Took off perfectly. No pilot could have handled the Messerschmitt 110 aircraft any better. Then Hess's adjutants got together in my office and sat around my desk. We waited to see if Hess would come back, but nothing happened. It grew dark, night came along, then one adjutant put his hand in his pocket and took out a sealed envelope. He said, now I have an important duty. I have to carry this letter to the Fuhrer. Hess speeds north. A radio station plays a popular song over and over, a Hess request. He uses it now for navigation. In Berlin, the letter Hess's adjutant has delivered makes Hitler scream and diplomatic channels crackle. In Italy, Mussolini fears Hitler is betraying him. In Moscow, Stalin is certain Hitler is plotting with Winston Churchill. Joseph Goebbels writes, Hess brought us close to ruin with our allies. Hess's family, Pinch, Messerschmitt, Cadden, others are arrested. Hess is mad, Hitler tells the German people, to whom military conquest has so far brought only hardship. Now their perfect Nazi is gone. A Berlin taxi driver sums up a common feeling. We will win and win and win, he mutters, until we lose. Hess has memorized his route to Scotland thoroughly. North toward Norway, west, then south. I could have flown it in my sleep, he says. He hedge hops with great pleasure. He climbs, and as he shows in this sketch he made later for his son, parachutes. He lands just 12 miles from the home of the astonished man he hopes to see first, the Duke of Hamilton. Forget about who was a better pilot. Uh, Goering, of course, was an ace. Hess was not. He landed on the Duke of Hamilton's estate, and a farmer with a pitchfork saw him land and thought the invasion had started, and marched him off to the local constabulary. And the whole thing was blown. So, of course, under a great cover of secrecy, the British put Hess under arrest, put him in prison. They didn't allow us to interview him. Nobody was allowed to talk. Um, Churchill was smart enough to know that if the Americans, maybe the American media, find out that there is a pro-German element in, German, uh, in, in England, uh, the Americans might not be so hot about getting in, in the support of England, getting involved in World War II. That was one of their, their thinking, keep the Americans out of it, as long as we were kept in the dark. So they kept Hess for four and a half years incognito. Hospital South Wales. Hess is now more a patient than a prisoner. Sometimes lucid, sometimes not, he develops amnesia. Later, he writes his wife, something pleasant, my memory has returned. But he believes German soldiers are being hypnotized from afar by the Jews. In Germany, Billy Messerschmitt, defending himself for letting Hess take a plane, says, how was I to know one so high in the Reich could be crazy? Whether Rudolf Hess is legally insane will plague the Nuremberg trials to come. Trials, 1945. If Hess is really insane, how can he be tried with his old Nazi colleagues as a war criminal? Confronted with Goering, his former secretaries, some of his oldest friends, most believe him mad. Seven psychiatrists, however, American, British, French, and Russian, conclude Hess has recovered from a true psychotic episode induced by the ignominious failure of his mission. He is unstable, and he has, doctors say, a culturally conditioned pseudo-paranoia, but is legally sane and can be tried. However, the War Crimes Tribunal must decide if Hess's loss of memory will hinder his ability to defend himself. A chief American prosecutor at Nuremberg, Telford Taylor. Uh, one of the lawyers, one of the other lawyers on the staff assisting Justice Jackson was the late uh, John Harlan Amon, a prominent uh, New York attorney. Uh, Eamon got the idea that he would uh, uh, collect a lot of documentary movies of the Nazi period, movies which showed Hess himself, showed him with Hitler, showed him addressing great uh, party rallies, showed him in all kinds of different situations in the period before he flew to England. 
Uh, and uh, he would bring in Hess uh, with a lot of people, uh, a lot of witnesses there, and uh, sit Hess down and show him these movies and, uh, and see if that did anything to restore uh, Hess's memory. Well, I'm afraid it didn't work very well. Uh, these movies were very interesting, and uh, Hess watched them with great interest. And uh, at the end of them, uh, John Harlan Amon said to him, well, Hess, do, uh, do you remember anything? Hess said no. That was that. Associate Prosecutor William Baldwin, who prosecuted the case against defendant Hans Frank, was an assistant to Colonel John Amon, and was very much involved in the Rudolf Hess interrogation. One of the things that I can't give you, although you can look at it, was the interrogation of Hess with these other guys. What's your full name, Rudolf Hess? I sat in on this because I was interested in it. This is after he was brought back. Your name is Rudolf Hess, yes. You look to the right of this gentleman. At him, pointing to Goering. Yes. Don't you know me, Goering says? Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> you ought to know, we've been together for years. That must have been at the same time as the book that was submitted to me this morning. I've lost my memory for some time. It's terrible. Don't you know me? You don't recognize me? Gurney was furious. No, but we talked a lot together. Not personally, but I remember your name. We were together. They were both in the Richthofen squadron. Listen, Hess, I was the Supreme Commander of the Luftwaffe. You flew to England in one of my planes. Don't you remember I was the Supreme Commander? First I was a field marshal and later a rice marshal. Don't you remember? Yes, no. <laughs> Don't you remember I was made a rice marshal, a rice marshal at the meeting of the rice dog where you were present? Don't you remember that? Yes, no. <laughs> Don't you remember that the Fuhrer at the meeting of the rice dog announced in the rice dog that something happened to him, that I would be his successor? If something happened to me, you were to be my successor? Don't you remember that? No. You don't remember that? We two discussed that very long afterwards. Yes, this is terrible. The doctors, blah, blah, blah. And you were there? Yeah. The head of the United States Army Interrogation Unit at Nuremberg was Richard W. Sonnenfeld. We had a chance to interview some Mr. Sonnenfeld in December of 2003. And he was in the middle of that interrogation. Received this transcript from Bill Baldwin, uh, one of the prosecutors for Justice Jackson, who was a second in below Colonel Amon. And Bill Baldwin, when I interviewed him in New Hampshire, I asked him, I said, is there anything I should be asking you? And he pulled out of his drawer a transcript, and he started reading it. And he st just was, was very engaging. Listen to this, listen to this, listen to Colonel Amon said, listen to this. And then he said, uh, when he got done, I said, would you like a copy of it? And I said, yes, I would. So he gave it to me. And I'm going to give it to you. And I know this brings back memories of I mean, just, just to look at. That brings back some memories. Oh, sure. <laughs> Well, I, I tell you, it's, it's one of the, uh, this is one of the scenes uh, that I describe in my book. Uh, well, you, you know, Rudolf Hess uh, once was the uh, principal deputy of Adolf Hitler. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there was always some confusion. He was the principal deputy of Hitler for the leadership of the party. He, he was never really the principal deputy as head of state. Goering became that later. But uh, Hess, you know, as you know, uh, stole, uh, absconded with an airplane to England. I mean, you know, the whole story, trying to persuade the British to uh, make a separate peace so that Hitler could uh, 
attack uh, the Soviet Union in, with nobody else to worry about. And in, uh, in England, uh, he, he then exhibited some strange symptoms. I mean, he started hoarding food samples because he believed uh, his British captors were trying to poison him, and he certainly behaved irrationally. At any rate, at the end of the war, he was a prisoner in Britain, and he was brought to Nuremberg. And when he arrived at Nuremberg, and I can't remember now whether that was the first time uh, that he did this, but at Nuremberg, from the very beginning, he claimed to have amnesia. Mm -hmm. And because he had amnesia, and by the way, he was an, an unindicted material witness like all of the other defendants, I mean, when I first met them, you know, in July and August, they weren't, they weren't indicted on, until October the 20th, and our job was basically to find out who should be indicted and for what. Yeah. Because in general, we knew what had happened, but we didn't know who had done what. So at any rate, uh, Hess was an unindicted material witness who pretended to have total amnesia. I mean, we've been together for years. Well, that must have been the same time said has as the book that was submitted. Goering, uh, don't you know me? <laughs> ah, not personally, but I remember your name says has. And uh, now, Goering, but we talked a lot together. Let, let me see what oh, I can, yeah. what I can find the point where he bragged about how important he was and how crushed he was that even his august uh, titles didn't get. <laughs> yeah, here's Goring, you see, I told you. <laughs> Listen, Hess, I was the supreme commander of the Luftwaffe, and you flew to England in one of my planes. <laughs> Don't you remember that I was the supreme commander of the Luftwaffe? <laughs> First, I was a field marshal and later a Reichsmarschall. Don't you remember? And uh, I remember Hess staring at him and saying, no. Don't you remember that I was made a <laughs> Reichsmarschall at a meeting of the Reichstag? So on and so forth. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can tell oh. my memory of the occasion was <laughs> reasonably accurate, but I have to tell you, he was a householder, and I, I'd have to look at this we to see it. whether it's reflected it in here, Haushofer broke out in tears when Hess, who had been his protege, and whom he'd regarded as a son. By the way, before that, uh, we had Hess meet with his secretaries, who ran shrieking and weeping from the room because their idealized boss, Hess, didn't recognize him. Well, Haushofer wept. by the four nations that tried Nazi criminals at Nuremberg was unlike any other before or since. But Prosecutor Robert Jackson had insisted that its basic rules and procedures be patterned after the adversarial system used in trials in England and in the United States. Lawyers submitted evidence, they examined and cross-examined witnesses, and they brought and argued motions. Our focus now returns to the Nuremberg courtroom where the presiding judge has cleared the defendant's area so that the court can hear a motion brought by an attorney for just one defendant, Adolf Rudolf Hess, now the only defendant in the dock. The question is whether Hess is mentally competent to stand trial. Attention, tribunal. Counsel for the defendant, Hess. Hohensgericht. Meine Richter. May it please the tribunal, I am speaking as counsel for the defendant Rudolf Hess. In the proceedings that have already been opened against Hess, 
the court is to decide solely the question of whether the defendant is fit or unfit to be heard and further whether he might even be considered entirely responsible. If his inability to plead is recognized, I request that the proceedings against the defendant not be conducted in his absence. Is it not consistent with all the medical opinions that the defendant is capable of understanding the course of the proceedings and that the only defect from which he is suffering is forgetfulness about what happened before he flew to England. Mr. President, it is true that the experts consider the defendant has capable of following the proceedings. But, on the other hand, in answer to the questions put to them, they emphasize that the defendant is not capable of defending himself. The United States uh, took this position. Uh, the psychiatrist's report indicated that uh, Hess had refused to allow any uh, narcosis drugs to be administered to him. The psychiatrist had wished uh, to give him various drugs which might either stimulate his memory or enable them to tell better the extent to which he was faking. And Hess had refused to allow these drugs to be administered to him. His uh, uh, amnesia is not of the type that's a complete blotting out of the personality, of the type uh, that uh, uh, is, uh, would be fatal to his defense. Uh, so we, uh, we feel that uh, so long as Hess refuses the ordinary, simple expedients, uh, even if his amnesia is genuine, that he is not in a position to continue to assert that he must not be brought to trial. We think this trial should proceed. Before the tribunal had a chance to come to any conclusion about it, uh, uh, Hess himself said he wanted to be heard. I have gleich zu begin der Verhandlung meinen Verteidiger he said that uh, he had been feigning, uh, pretending his amnesia, uh, and uh, he wished the tribunal now to know that he was in possession of his faculties, uh, that his concentration was a little disturbed, but that he could remember now, and he wished to take his place with his fellow defendants and to be tried. This is granted. Did you sense he, did you sense he was incompetent? Uh, he was out of it. Yeah. The strange thing, though, I was in court when uh, the, uh, there were a group of four uh, appointed to examine. They were all generally well known for for their fields and uh, mental conditions, etc. And they came in with a report that uh, Hess was was out of it. That he was, and uh, Hess who was sitting there reading a book. This was about five o'clock in the afternoon maybe four or something like this, got up and said, well, he was perfectly all right to stand trial, that, uh, he, that all of this had been put on. And the, <laughs> the journalists came running back. It was extraordinary. Of course, he lapsed after that. Right? He had a momentary flash. <laughs> Don't worry about me, fellows. Did it take everybody by surprise? Yes. <laughs> the end of the story in that uh, the court ordered, after he was indicted, he was indicted and he was in the court, and the court ordered him to be examined by, among others, uh, Soviet psychiatrists. And uh, in order to avoid that examination, Hess stood up in the court and he said, you know, I have an announcement to make. And you know what the announcement was? I can hear his words like today. From today on, my memory will again be available to the outside world. President, ask each defendant for his plea. The defendant to plead guilty or not guilty to the charges against them. Rudolf Hess.
that will be entered as a plea of not guilty. The prosecution presents a chart of the Nazi organization. An American lawyer explains, the Fuhrer is the supreme and only leader in the Nazi hierarchy. And here he makes a slip. He says, his successor designate was first the defendant Hess, and subsequently the defendant Goering. Both Hess and Goering hear this in the German translation. And uh, Goering, as you may know, was a man of a great and enormous vanity. And uh, when he heard this coming over the translation system, that uh, the American lawyer was saying that he was number three and Hess number two, uh, why Goering was immediately uh, uh, very much piqued, and he began waving around and pointing to himself, Ich bin die Zweite. I was the second. And uh, calling everybody's attention to the fact that, that he'd been demoted quite unjustly. Uh, well, uh, while Goering was going through these antics to try to call attention to uh, the true state of uh, affairs, uh, Hess looked over at Goering, who was sitting on his right, and uh, saw what Goering was doing. Then he leaned back and he laughed and laughed and laughed. And uh, this led me, at least, to believe that uh, Hess's amnesia was, in part at least, feigned. And I so expressed the opinion then. Hess seems happy. He writes to his wife, Dearest little mommy, my comrades recognize with joy I am still exactly the same man. But he has stomach cramps, says his guards are poisoning him. Co-defendant Albert Speer says, in German, what a screwball. During Hess's defense, the Nazis fear he will make fools of them. Goering is mocking. Another one asks, this is what Hitler called a political leader? Walter Funk says, seriously, it is not funny. It is disgraceful. And these are... He's very flaky, his personality. Uh, you never dared ask him, how are you today? Could he tell you? He had something wrong with him all the time. I mean, he was a hypochondriac. I think he had just about every doctor in Germany check him out. And after he ran out of doctors, he went to all the cracks. He tried everything. He, he was a hypochondriac from the word go. And he was a vegetarian. Even when he was invited to Hitler to dine with Hitler, he brought his own food, uh, which Hitler resented and finally told him that he had to eat the same thing he had. Well, Hitler was a vegetarian, too, so the two of them got along fine, but they finally ended up chewing on the same cabbage. <laughs> <coughs> but Hess was interesting because of his, his quakery. Um, he was really not a died-in-a-wool Nazi. That did not motivate Hess. What motivated Hess was his great admiration and affection for Hitler. Hess was um, a personality. He was not a leader at all. He was a follower, and he needed a father. Ed. Ashamed of Hess's naive personal offer of peace to Britain, of which he is most proud. Hess asked to make a final statement before the verdict. Einige meiner Kameraden hier können bestätigen, dass ich bereits zu Beginn des Prozesses... A large part of this uh, last statement of his, which uh, was about, oh, 20 minutes long, was very rambling and inarticulate, and had to do with uh, uh, how there are a lot of people around him while he was in prison in England who had glassy eyes and stared at him in a strange way. And much of what he said, uh, as I say, is incoherent and, uh, and uh, suggestive of profound abnormality in his mind. Uh, but after the court had said, you've been talking for 20 minutes and uh, time's running out, he then said at the end, uh, I was permitted to work for many years of my life under the greatest son whom my people has brought forth in its thousand year history, meaning Hitler. Even if I could, I would not want to erase this period of time from my existence. I am happy to know that I have done my duty to my people, my duty as a German, as a National Socialist, as a loyal follower of my Fuhrer. I do not regret anything. It is October 1st, 1946, the day of judgment. Hess will leave the court, strut to his cell, laugh, and say he did not hear the verdict and does not care what the sentence will be. Defendant Rudolf Hess, on the counts of the indictment, on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to imprisonment for life. 
has served that life sentence in Spandau Prison in Germany. His late years clouded in mystery and speculation. There were some who claimed that the mad old man, for years the only Nazi prisoner left in the prison, was not really Hess at all. Some advanced the theory that Hess never made it to England, that an imposter took his place, and that the imposter may have been a Soviet KGB agent attempting to find out whether the British were planning to turn against the Soviet Union in an alliance with the Nazis. The strange case of Rudolf Hess will most likely never be fully explained or understood. He lived to be 93 and then died in, in Potsdam. Oddly enough, uh, during our embassy years, uh, General John Mitchell, who was the commandant of the Berlin Brigade, and these were the crack American troops who were in Berlin, 20,000 of them, who would be a front line of defense in case the Soviets ever uh, caused a problem. They were on a suicide mission because they were completely surrounded sure. by the Soviets, but they were our, our very finest soldiers. And General John, uh, Major General, was the commanding officer. And I had invited him to come to Luxembourg to speak at our Memorial Day at the American Cemetery, where Patton is buried, by the way. And Mitchell came, and we became good friends, and he invited Winnie and me to visit them in Berlin. So we got, had a real treat riding the General's train through East Germany. Uh, General's train was a locomotive, dining car, and sleeping car. Just the two of us and my military aide, Lieutenant Colonel De Luca, Army and his wife, just four of us, had a whole train with barbed wire on both sides of the tracks all the way through East Germany from Fulda to Berlin. And the train wasn't allowed to stop. The doors were locked. But uh, because I was an ambassador, every time we came t to a town, the train would slow down, and I would have to go to the door, and the window would be rolled down, and there'd be a Soviet armed guard presenting a salute. Now we'd turn their salute, and then the train would speed up again. But beautifully synchronized and, and a big ego trip. No, sure. I love it. <laughs> you know, every time having these Soviets present arms, and yeah. I'd go on through. They treated us very correctly. Well, we got to Berlin, and the reason I mention this is General Mitchell organized a, a helicopter flight over Berlin uh, for me. And so we flew over Potsdam, which is behind the Berlin Wall. And we flew over Potsdam, and I saw Hess no in his garden. He had a little garden in a prison enclosure. And that particular month, the British were guarding him. If it had been, I mean, the, the Russians were guarding him, I'm sorry. The, the Soviets were guarding him. If the British or the Americans, or even the French, if it had been their turn, I would have been allowed to visit him. And I, I would have loved to go see him 40 years later oh, yeah. and, and talk to him again and see if he remembered me. <laughs> well, Russians secures the sentence. If Hess had succeeded on the peace mission, Germany could have turned all its might on the Soviet Union. They ensure that he serves his full term in prison. Right up to the end, Hess remains in contact with his wife. People often believe that my husband is insane. Uh, from the letters he is writing every week to the family, uh, you can uh, say that if a man who writes such letters is insane, I should be definitely insane myself. He is the last inmate of Spandau Prison in West Berlin, where he dies at the age of 93 on August 17, 1987. But even his death is fraught with inconsistency. The official version is that he commits suicide by hanging himself. But some historians claim he is murdered. Autopsy reports state that marks on his neck indicate that he was strangled. In September of 2002, the Robert H. Jackson Center played host to Dr. John K. Latimer, an American physician who attended, observed, and spoke on a personal basis 
with the 22 top Nazi leaders on trial as one of the Nuremberg physicians. He has a unique story on the end of Rudolf Hess. Yeah. What, what was your take on him? Did, was he, was there complete amnesia here? Uh, no, he was pretty well over the amnesia, uh, in my opinion. I, from then on, I, I thought he was, he was, uh, what's the word, uh, faking it uh, a lot of the time. And then, of course, they put him away. He was the only one left. And he had this little, little hut out in the, in the yard, sc screened hut. And uh, uh, one day, the nurses came back and found him dead or almost dead, and he died almost right after. His, his, his son got a hold of me, knowing I'd taken care of him, and said, you know, you gotta help me with this. And I said, well, what, you know, what can I do? And he said, well, I've had a second autopsy done, and, and you'll see it in my slides. The mark of the, of the thing is, goes straight around his neck is when you're garroted. Somebody had garroted him. He hadn't hanged himself. and. Uh, he, he died, he didn't die at that moment, but he died a few hours later. And uh, uh, I said, well, uh, the United States authority on garroting versus hanging is so-and-so, and we'll get a hold of him. But this man said that, well, when, when you hang yourself, the rope comes up here, and it doesn't hit your thyroid cartilage. But if you, somebody garrots you, it breaks the tips off your thyroid cartilage. It's a straightaway, uh, uh, differential diagnosis. And his were broken off, just like if somebody garroted him. And the mark goes straight around his neck. And uh, it's no doubt that he was garroted. And uh, they, he was on the British, uh, we took turns being his guards, and he was on the British rotation, and everybody thought that the Brits let their Secret Service people knock him off so he wouldn't say anything about what had been going on with him to try and get him to talk when they had him as a prisoner for what, four years. And uh, uh, in any case, I got a hold of our expert in this differential diagnosis, and he wasn't clear that he wanted to have anything to do with it. And he said, well, when you're 86 years old or whatever he was. 90, yeah. 90, he said, uh, your tissues are so brittle that that breaking off thing is not really a valid uh, basis for the only comparison. So I couldn't do much for him, but uh, my own opinion is that somebody did go out and kill him. Right. of the man he admired most, he risked everything to restore his name. Instead, his mission ended in disaster. Any friends he may have had within the British establishment distanced themselves from him. Hess dies a deeply disturbed man. It was the ultimate failure for a man who risked everything to win. His fate sealed in a mysterious flight over 60 years ago.